All right, Dr. Nick Norwitz, what's going on with sweeteners? What's going on with like sucralose lately? Just let's jump right in. Mm -hmm. I love sweeteners as a topic because I think it's an area where people love to jump immediately towards heuristics. Everybody's like, all right, it doesn't have calories, therefore it must be benign. Or, you know, there's no such thing as a free metabolic lunch, so it must be harmful. Or they heuristic can be, oh, it's a natural sweetener versus it's artificial. And that's good versus bad, right? And so we love to generate these heuristics for sweeteners. The fact of the matter is they are phenomenally heterogeneous molecules, just like there's lots of different sources of protein or lots of different fatty acids. These are each unique mo molecules which have unique effects and unique metabolic contexts and need to be studies as such. And it doesn't make it simple, but it does make it really interesting. So, um, you mentioned sucralose for one, and I think that's a really interesting example of an artificial sweetener, which definitely has some problems, but again, you need to bring some context to it. So there was a really interesting randomized controlled trial done out of the small lab at Yale. It was published in, um, I think it was Cell or Cell Metabolism uh, 2020, where they were looking at the effects of, I think it was seven drinks um, over two weeks, um, of a sucralose containing drink versus um, just a regular sugar drink that had 120 calories per drink versus a combination of this non-caloric um, sucralose and maltodextrin, which is a less sweet sugar. And so at the time, they were testing the what's called the uncoupling hypothesis, which at a very high level is kind of simple to intuit, which is like your body tastes sweet but if it gets sweet and doesn't get any calories in your body, it's going to be like, ah, where are the calories? And freak out and you're going to get metabolic dysfunction. You know what I mean? Like your body will learn that there is an uncoupling between the sweet taste and uh, the energy you received. And that will screw things up. Turns out that's not what they found. So again, this was a three-arm randomized control trial where there was the sugar, the sugar plus the sucralose and then um, the pure sucralose. So they thought based on their uncoupling, the pure sucralose would cause the mess up. The interesting thing was it was the combination that caused profound insulin resistance um, in uh, adults. And actually they did a sub-study in adolescents, age 13 to 17, um, which was terminated early because the effects on insulin resistance, home IR, were so profound that for ethical reasons, they terminated it. Um, so. That's an example of where there can clearly be a negative metabolic effect, but actually context matters. So extrapolating to real world, the implication would be having, you know, um, I think I calculated it out. It was something like two and a half little packs of like, um, the, what is it, the stevia, not the, the Splenda. Like you get those little Splenda packs out of sucralose. Um, it was like two and a half of those per day was like the dose, something like that. So a reasonable dose. Having that in your morning black coffee would be less metabolically damaging based on just these literature than having it say in the form of like a sweetened yogurt, which also has carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. um, so really interesting case of where context matters. After today's video, I put a link down below for Thrive Market. That is a 30% off discount link plus a free Gift. So 30% off your entire grocery order. The thing I like about Thrive Market is they're trying to help get gnarly processed foods out of people's fridge and out of people's pantries. So these are healthier for you options, better for you options, and the prices are highly, highly competitive. So a lot of times you're gonna find prices cheaper than the grocery store and it's delivered directly to your doorstep. So when it comes to like recalibrating your pantry, Thrive Market really, really is solid. It's very helpful to be able to have all your grocery shopping at your fingertips so you're not stressed about finding the right things. You can search. You can do a quick search for gluten-free. You can do a search for paleo. You can do a search for sugar-free, for keto, for this, for that, all at your fingertips, and then it's delivered directly to your doorstep. But let's be real, we're all pinching some pennies. So the best thing about it is that 30% off discount link off your entire grocery order using that link down below. I use my Thrive Box consistently. I'm always changing up stuff. I'm always getting a Thrive order coming in a couple times per month and it helps save me a bunch of money, but it also gets me some really cool stuff that I otherwise wouldn't find at the grocery store. So check them out in the top line of the description underneath this video. One other thing I'll add to this study, because I just found it such a fascinating study, was they were also doing brain scans at the time, um, fMRI, um, functional magnetic resonance imaging, and they found changes in uh, dopamine reward circuitry, the mesolimbic areas of the brain. And that opened up a whole 
canister of really fascinating questions, which is like, why did the combination of carbs and this sweetener change insulin resistance and change dopamine reward circuitry? Is it a bottom-up process whereby peripheral insulin resistance affects the brain, a top-down process, or is there a common underlying mechanism? And then piggybacking on that, one of the reasons they did the adolescent sub-study is um, because adolescents have like physiologic insulin resistance or insulin goes up, it helps them grow. Let's say for a moment, it was a top-down process where the changes in the brain dopamine circuitry were affecting peripheral insulin resistance. If teenagers in a critical period of brain development are being hit with this metabolic insult, could it prime their brain that then gets cemented in their adulthood for life to have metabolic dysfunction. So I throw all those things out there because on the one hand, you have a very interesting phenomenon and demonstration of metabolic harm in a randomized controlled trial, but you also have context around that. And you also have these other questions that you probably couldn't easily figure out the answers to in a randomized controlled trial fashion. Like does the sucralose that is combined with carbohydrates change brain structure in a way that could screw up adolescence metabolism for life. It's a possibility and it's a provocative one. The data don't say that, but in deciding what we do every day, I think we need to consider what's been shown and then also what the unknowns are and what risks we want to take. So that was a really interesting study. What do you think it is about combining sucralose with sugar? Is it the fact that, okay, we actually have calories being ingested? Would it be interesting if it was, uh, you know, sucralose alongside just additional calories because i mean that wasn't an arm right like so it was just like could it have been the calories or because if it was i mean sugar yes and i'm sure that has a stronger effect there but what about if it was like sucralose in butter i don't know yeah i i i genuinely don't know i they didn't present a lot of um like biological plausibility breakdown it was like a capture and report these kind of studies, I think I once heard one of the authors talking about the study. It was something like a, maybe it was another study from that lab, but like these studies can take six or seven years. So this is 2020. I suspect there's going to be follow-up because it was a high profile study, but in terms of why the combination had a negative effect and whether combination with, I mean, even other sugars, there was maltodextrin there. What if you used fructose? What if you, again, use other sources of calories? I don't know what the answer would be. Um, so I, I just don't know, but I'm very curious to find out. Let's pivot to, to aspartame for just a second yeah. or aspartame, depending on how yeah. you want to say it. How would you, and this is going to be your own personal opinion. So no one's going to, mm -hmm. you know, hold this to you, hold you to aspartame versus sucralose. Would you pick one over the other? I think it's a weird, I'm going to say no, because it's a weird binary because you'll never have just those choices. You always have other options. I think both of them are problematic to the point that me personally, I will not touch either of them really with the slight exception. And this is not a paper motion, but I have been busy in medical school and have had keto chow, which has sucralose. So I break my own rules. Um, but in all seriousness, sucralose, we went over one study that, you know, is problematic about it. Aspartame has a lot of studies suggesting that it is problematic. Um, and biological plausibility in terms of how it breaks down and changes um, neurotransmitter precursors to the brain that supports things like anxiety phenotypes and mood disturbances. And the reason I like to bring up the study I'm going to bring up is specifically because it's an example of a concerning effect, um, but one that could never be studied in human literature. And I think that's important because... Sometimes we just need to say in science, like we can only ask certain questions in certain ways and we'll never have the quote perfect study to demonstrate this point. Nevertheless, we might take it with a grain of salt, but we should still take it as interesting. So the study I'll bring up was one in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2022 on um, aspartame and anxiety, which has actually been shown in at least one human RCT. They coded it as irritability if you're doing a PubMed search, but um they were using rats. And the reason they were using rats, or maybe it was mice, it was a rodent. Um, they wanted to see what the uh, effect of aspartame was, but also asking the question, could it be an inherited phenotype? As in, could you give rodents aspartame, produce an anxiety phenotype, which you can kind of test by putting them in a little space and seeing how much they explore the center 
versus the edges. There are validated methods to do that. Could it actually be inherited to their offspring, even though the offspring had never been exposed to aspartame? So for this study, um, the dose was also important. They used the equivalent of what a human drinking two to four Diet Cokes per day would be. So not like super physiologic crazy doses you can ever get in humans. Very possible doses. It was eight to 15% the like, not the RDA, but the tolerable limit that's proposed by the FDA. And they found indeed it produced an anxiety phenotype and the offspring had an anxiety phenotype, at least at the two Diet Coke dose. Um, again, this is adjusting for changes in body size. It wasn't like two Diet Cokes absolute, but like if a human had two Diet Cokes. And then to the grandsires of these animals when they had the um, four Diet Coke dose. And so it's like, okay, let's think about Diet Coke containing aspartame, kind of throwing it under the bus, but like as a tool. I'm not saying anybody shouldn't have it. It's not my role to tell you what to do or not to do. But when I see data like those, what goes through my mind is like the question of like, what is the cost to giving this up in favor of something else? Like some seltzer with a little squeeze of lemon juice in it. When there might be a possibility that this could maybe even affect your offspring. Again, we'll never have a randomized control trial on humans to demonstrate this point. You just couldn't ever conduct it. But for me, those data are actually quite one, curious about how it changes sperm epigenetics since it was actually looked at through the male lineage. Um, but also like interesting enough and compelling enough to actually motivate me to make behavior change in my life because again, in the real world, what is the cost? Like how much do you really want this as a tool? And if you're informed of these potential consequences, like we talked about with sucralose or aspartame, and you still decide this is important for you to have in your life, that that's totally your choice as an adult. But big picture with the sweetener thing, like I said in the beginning, I think people reduce it to heuristics and they want a simple answer. The fact of the matter is these are complex heterogeneous molecules with complex effects. And I think to allow people to make informed decisions, we just need to talk about each one in different contexts, talk about the literature, the limitations of this literature, and then people can decide what they want to do at the end of the day. If we're talking about, uh, you know, sort of this offspring type discussion here, I mean, genetically, epigenetically, obviously obesity could be an issue passing down, mm -hmm. like more feasibly. Do you think, well, I shouldn't even ask you if you think, but I mean, it kind of poses the question of, okay, if someone loses weight and then gets pregnant and sucralose or aspartame mm -hmm. is a tool for them to lose weight and they're putting themselves in a healthier metabolic state, let's just pretend for a second that they didn't consume any, you know, while they were pregnant. Okay. And they just use this to, you know, for a long period of time to lose weight. You know, question that comes to mind for me, and I'm kind of in the same boat as you, I don't over consume sweeteners. I do consume sucralose. I'll consume occasionally aspartame, but it's not like I'm seeking it out mm -hmm. every day. It's usually periods of indulgence usually. Yeah. But it makes me wonder like, okay, well, if someone's going to drop 50 pounds and they're going to put themselves in better metabolic health, is that a good trade-off even when you're looking at, you know, what you're passing on to your offspring? I would say yes. Mm -hmm. like, that seems a relatively clear cut to me. Um, the question I would then ask is, is the Diet Coke a tool, like a necessary tool in their journey? If their honest answer to themselves is yes, then great. Yeah. That's fine. But I, I agree. I think in in you you pose that scenario, I would say use it as a tool. So again, I'm not saying it's all bad or all good. I'm just saying here are the literature that you can, you know, value put value judgments on them for yourself and then make a decision at the end of the day. But the the oversimplicity of you know, oh, well, this hasn't been shown in humans or it's no calorie, so it's benign or it's artificial and you're cheating, so it's bad. Like that serves no one. So I, I like the topic because it is so complex with, as we've discussed, some pretty unexpected and interesting findings. What about if we pivot over to like Stevia, for example? Stevia has been making some headlines over the last couple of years, um, not even the erythritol side, but, you know, there's a lot of questions. I see comments all the time that pop up. What's your take on C? I mean, just something that's just a concentrated sweet in yeah. general. Is there potentially a problem there, even from a you know a dopamine perspective? Like, are you getting yourself almost hooked on like something sweet, and is that going to transfer over to not necessarily sweet cravings, but even just 
Okay, let's just use a, this is a very soft example because it's my own anecdotal experience. I notice like when I consume more artificially or naturally sweetened things, when I don't have those, I'm like on my phone more, or it's like I'm trying to fill a void. It's like mm-hmm. there's a dopamine hit that I'm seeking. That's the question that I always have is like looking at the metabolic side, no, like completely aside, is there this effect where you're like, you're getting kind of hooked on something and you're giving yourself a hit do sweet things, like even just from artificial or natural sweeteners, is that still a dopamine hit that we should possibly be concerned with? I would say your mileage may vary. This is an area where I really think it's about introspecting on how the sweet of it affects you as a person. If it's something that helps you maintain your lifestyle, then use it as a tool. If it's something that would tend to get you to, you know, fall off the bandwagon because you're just gonna like want more and more sweet, and you might identify as like a sweet addict or a sugar addict, then maybe avoid it. But this is just a matter of like, some people do good wading into things, some people do good with cold turkey. And I I think that is the basis truth I could bring to that topic. We could talk about things like cephalic phase insulin response. You get like a little insulin boost if you have anything sweet, but I don't think those actually have much clinical translatability. On stevia itself, from the literature I've read, I see it as pretty like neutral and benign metabolically. I've really seen nothing on it being harmful. Um, so it's one of the ones I put into the neutral camp. There was a recent study, um, you know, Ben Bickman, mm-hmm. his lab had a study out comparing stevia to allulose, which is a rare sugar and very low calorie sweetener. That was an interesting one because it actually did have uh, the basic finding that stevia is benign, but there was an end this advantage of uh, this other um, no low calorie sweetener, which I raise as just, again, an extreme example of how these different sweet molecules can have different effects. And some of them might even be good. I don't rule that out. We kind of talk about the, you know, zero to negative realm in, in these regions. And then maybe the only positive being from the elimination of the caloric load or something like that. I also would not rule out the possibility that just because something like something could be sweet and lower zero calorie and can have very positive metabolic benefits, that's also possible. This is just physiology and chemistry. Um, how it's mediated, um, there are some probably direct effects on fat cells, um, some effects on GLP-1, um, although I don't know how clinically relevant those are, but in the study that I brought up, it was shown that allulose could protect against Western diet-induced obesity in mice, where stevia couldn't. So. In healthy mice, it didn't have a weight loss effect, but in those challenged with a westernized diet, um, it actually did have quote, anti-obesogenic effects as compared to stevia. So good example of how like these could possibly have positive benefits, some of them in certain contexts, um, and that deserves to be studied too. If we kick it old school for a second, we talk about you know, some of the uh, older literature that's still kind of, well, it's still being looked at, but it's what comes up in discussion all the time is the effect of sucralose on the microbiome. Mm-hmm. Is that research that we should really be doubling down on? Or is that so complex that it's really almost, I don't know, impossible to really nail down? I think it's definitely something we should consider. Um, the study that, or the group of studies that come to mind, a lot of work went out of the Weizmann Institute in Israel. I think Aaron Segal was the senior author on that one something like ZV Nature 2014 or something, although that could be confusing papers, but they did one beautiful study where they were looking at artificial sweeteners. I think they included aspartame, sucralose, saccharin. They did the most of the work on saccharin, but a lot of it was looking at the microbiome. And again, to show causality, the cleanest way to do it is generally in mice, because you can have germ-free mice without a microbiome and do like fecal transplants. Mm-hmm. Um, but they had made a very compelling case that the microbiome gets screwed up to cause insulin resistance, including in humans. One experiment they did that was pretty brilliant, I think it was an N equals seven, which I'll get to the relevance of that in a moment, but they took people that were naive to artificial sweeteners and um, did a fecal transplant, which is a microbiome transplant from the humans to the mice. Before and after they were exposed to artificial sweeteners, oh, I think it, I think it was saccharin. Um, over, uh, I think it was a week period. And what they showed was that um, some of the humans 
were responders. I think four out of seven were responders and even in one week became insulin resistant. Mm. And they showed that in the responders transplanting their feces to mice conferred that insulin resistant phenotype. So if you have person A and you do the fecal transplant to the mouse before they have the exposure, the mouse is healthy. Then you give them the artificial sweetener, the human becomes insulin resistant. You then do the fecal transplant to the mouse, the mouse becomes insulin resistant. So that's pretty compelling as far as causal data go to suggest, I think, these sweeteners can screw up the microbiome to produce negative metabolic consequences. So I, I think these data are very relevant. Um, the question then arises, I did say what, N equals seven, don't quote me on these numbers, and I think four were responders. Does that mean three people were actually immune? Would they have become responders over more than a week? We don't know. So if you had an answer to that question, there might be someone who are more resistant to the negative effects um, based on what their baseline microbiome composition is. So that's possible. But answer to your question, is the microbiome and sweetener literature solid enough to be worthy of consideration? Yes. I think uh, anything solid enough to, you know, be concerned with and to take some pause, right? I think there's never a problem with saying, hey, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to take a pause on, on the Diet Cokes for a little bit until I do some more of my own research and determine if this is something that I really want to proceed with. As you mentioned, is this an actual tool that is necessary for me? And mm -hmm. there are plenty of people that I know that they just without a Diet Coke, they would make significantly worse decisions. And that's totally valid. I get it. Like that's, that's, yeah. that's acceptable to me. Um, then there's people that it's purely habitual. It's just like, no, I just, I have a couple of diet Cokes a day. It's just what I do. Well, have you ever considered like removing them? Mm -hmm. Well, no, I like them. Okay. Well try, see what happens. You yeah. know, um, you know, if the people tend to compare like a diet Coke to a regular Coke, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't really think we're talking apples to apples here. Like, and if you say like, okay, that person's not going to be drinking a diet Coke, so they'd be drinking a regular Coke. I don't think that's always the case. Right. I think if someone wants the sweet hit, they want the sweet hit and they'll probably choose though. I think most people would want to choose the one that's probably slightly better for them. So they'd probably say, okay, there's zero calories. I'll go for a diet Coke. Mm -hmm. People that are a little less concerned and just don't care. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting. This is purely my own observation. But most of the people that I see drinking regular Coke, in my opinion, at least here in California, are actually like skinnier people. And it's probably people that are just like, oh, I can handle the sugar just fine. You know, it's, so it's kind of interesting. I see a lot of overweight people drinking Diet Coke. That's not to say that Diet Coke makes you fat. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that regular Coke makes you thin. I think I do notice that people that like, they understand that calorie concept at a basic level and they say, okay, well, I'm going to switch to a Diet Coke. So I see people that are struggling with their weight drinking Diet Coke more than I see them drinking regular Coke. Mm -hmm. That may or may not be the truth. It's just my observation. Right. But again, a lot of thin people that I see, they have no problem just pounding regular sodas. So it is just kind of this question of, okay, well, what would happen if you just didn't have it all together? What's your take on something like Zevia in that case, like a Zevia soda? I was just about to bring that up. Is like you create the binary of Coke and Diet Coke. Well, it's like in the real world, you do have that option of the thing Zevia is a, the stevia sweetened beverage. Like choose that one. Yeah. Based on the literature, I think that would be the safer choice. And I think most people, when armed with knowledge from the literature, even if we take it with the caveats that we need to take it with, again, want to make the best choice for themselves. And it's not that, it doesn't seem like that much to sacrifice from a third person perspective. Now, if it is for that person, then they can have the Diet Coke, but allow people to make those more informed decisions and also take steps to better their metabolic health as steps. You don't need to make all changes at once. So if you're starting on a journey and you're going to start by like cutting out sugar, you're going to use Diet Coke as a tool, then great. Maybe there's a time in the future where you're then going to swap over the Zevia. And then maybe you're just going to go to sparkling water or water. Like the cool thing, I think, the thing that really gets me excited about metabolic health as a science and talking and teaching about it is because it's something that is accessible to literally everybody. Your body is your lab and it's not a chore to tweak things on it. It's kind of a privilege to get to always iterate and observe and experiment in your N equals one journey infinitum and hopefully always like improve along the way. And when you can really internalize that mindset, that pleasure, I think that is the key to unlocking good metabolic health 
forever. Even if that means at the beginning of that journey, you're having Diet Coke. I'm with you on that, man. Well, uh, Nick, where can everyone find you, brother? Um, at Nick Norwitz, N-I-C-N-O-R-W-I-T-Z. Uh, basically on any social. I don't think there's another Nick Norwitz in the world, so I'm pretty easy to find. Perfect. Right on, brother. Thanks. Thanks.